All right, so the title of uh, Guggen's presentation is Mapping Resilient Brain Aging. Guggen is the director of the WIG Neuroimaging Lab. He is an associate professor in the Center for Vital Longevity and School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences at the University of Texas at Dallas and in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Prior to moving to Texas, Guggen completed his PhD in cognitive neuroscience at Dartmouth College, followed by postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard University and Washington University School of Medicine. So without further ado, we'll let you take over. Great, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks to Randy for inviting me to be a uh, part of this workshop. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. You know, uh, you know, as you might have realized, I actually grew up in, in Vancouver, in Surrey specifically, uh, and uh, did my undergraduate training uh, at the other university down the hill. Uh, so it would have been nice to be there, but um, a few challenges, logistic challenges that uh, prevented an in-person uh, presentation. Uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, give this format of talk. Uh, so uh, as my title notes, I'm going to be talking about uh, mapping resilient brain aging. Uh, I'm going to try to cover this uh, idea of mapping um, in several ways. I'll, I'll naturally talk about maps of, of brain topography, uh, but we've also been thinking about maps of physical space and how those might interact with maps of brain topography. And then finally, there's another way of creating a map, and that's by measuring interactions between nodes of a network. So you can create topological maps, uh, and, and I'll be discussing um, our intersection between those maps with the, uh, the two other types of maps you might be more familiar with. Um, so, you know, Dr. Costco uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the presentation immediately preceding this one, give a, a nice, nice slide uh, highlighting demographic shifts, uh, this idea that, uh, you know, there's a, a greater percentage of individuals in, in older age. Um, in parallel to that shift, though, you know, our bodies are living longer, but our brains are, are, not, are not healthier. Uh, so there's been this epidemiological transition whereby there's a reduction in, in infectious and acute diseases for the most part um, in the last few years uh, as an exception. Uh, but there's been this emerging prevalence of chronic and degenerative diseases. In this case, uh, it's, the slide is highlighting Alzheimer's disease and the projections of, of AD prevalence in the United States. Uh, and you can see that uh, AD um, burdens uh, individuals of older age in particular, uh, especially after the 80s. Um, but that there's there, there's projections that there's there's going to be quite a few individuals uh, infected with this disease uh, because of the changing demographics and the fact that we're the, that we're living longer. So I think you know one of the challenges in terms of uh, accelerating brain science and getting us up to speed with uh, the science of you know, heart health and diabetes management is that we we still have a number of curious observations that we we haven't been able to make sense of. Um, the idea of reserve has been mentioned several times uh, in this workshop, um, and, and this, this image, I think, depicts this idea uh, pretty nicely. Some individuals are cognitively resilient through brain pathology. So, you know, with the advent of uh, modern imaging techniques, we're able to now image uh, some of the plaques and tangles that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, we've, we've, we've seen that, you know, when you look at healthy individuals who are cognitively healthy, um, they, they might exhibit an absence of amyloid. And you could also observe in, in dimension individuals the presence of amyloid. Uh, but the surprising thing has been, you know, another segment of the population that are cognitively healthy, um, yet have a high degree of amyloid deposition. So the question is, what is allowing them to maintain cognitive function or, or remain resilient uh, to this brain pathology? Now, there's a few other really interesting and surprising observations, you know, one of which was actually made uh, or reported on a few days ago. Um, you know, there's there's forms of Alzheimer's disease that are related to an autosomal dominant mutation um, and are, are associated with the early onset of, of, of dementia. Um, but there's been now two reported cases um, where individuals are resistant to to this to the, the fact that they have this this this, very, uh, this, this uh, genetic predisposition. Um, so this is a report, uh, the more recent report um, highlighting a, a Colombian male individual who remained cognitively intact until 67 years of age, um, despite this mutation that uh, typically results in MCI by the age of 44 or dementia by the age of 49. Um, in keeping with that, this individual had elevated amyloid plaque burden, um, but then also had limited tau burden in, in locations of the brain that are typically associated with dementia. 
So this suggests that you know there, there's there's factors that might allow an individual to be resistant to this genetic predisposition. Uh, there's ideas here in this paper uh, that note that um, some of those factors might relate to alternate genes. Uh, but I think nonetheless, it's 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 interesting to think about these types of observations and why some individuals are able to uh, again be resilient to what seems like either uh, pathological burden or genetic burdens. So the focus of what I'm going to talk about today is this idea of our exposures. You know, we've we've, we've heard a lot about. Um, ways of thinking about exposures. Um, but the question is, can our exposures trigger or protect us from, from age-related brain disease? And the data suggests that there's a reason to believe that exposures do matter. So when we look at factors of socioeconomic status, such as education or community disadvantage, there's an increase in dementia prevalence among individuals who are lower uh, on these measures. So individuals lacking a college education, for example, uh, exhibit a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and, and, and vascular dementia and other non-categorized dementias. Uh, but even when you look at uh, indices of community disadvantage, individuals living in, in, in areas uh, that, are, that are scoring higher on these measures uh, have higher likelihood uh, of, of dementia and Alzheimer's disease specifically. Um, now, this isn't uh, limited to the United States or to Canada, um, but it's, it's really a, a global observation. Um, there's this burden and growth of dementia, and those burdens are the greatest for lower socioeconomic status countries. So what's being shown here in this map um, is the deaths from Alzheimer's disease and other dementias in, in 2012 per million persons. Uh, and you could see that, uh, that there, there, there are certain countries, in particular developing nations, that, have, uh, are, that, are, that are taking on a greater burden. Um, now, the plot on the right is showing you uh, a similar feature as, as, or similar observation as what I showed you in an earlier slide, um, whereby individuals are, are living longer, right? Um, but uh, despite, despite the extension of lifespan, um, we still have this, this, this uh, increased burden of, of dementia and related illnesses, illnesses that are particular, uh, particularly burdening uh, low and middle income countries. So it's a nice, nice quote that kind of accompanies this, this depiction. Some countries, some countries may actually grow old before they grow rich, right? So there's a population boom and there's an increase in individuals who are older, um, but the, there seem to be economic and social factors that haven't caught up uh, in these countries. And again, it's suggestive that there, there are exposures that are relevant. Now, it's, it's not a diploma on the wall that matters or how much is in your savings account. Uh, I think we all recognize that, uh, but we also all have ideas about what actually might matter uh, towards contributing to this risk of, of Alzheimer's or at risk of dementia more generally. Um, and just, just to highlight that, you know, it's, it's not all bad. There's observations on the flip side as well, right? So some of you might be familiar with this idea of blue zones. Um, these are places in the world where people are living healthier and living longer. Um, some of, you know, they have a high concentration of centenarians. And here too, uh, there's, there's indications that there's particular lifestyles or habits that are, are protective towards age-related age illness and, 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 and protective towards early deaths. Uh, and some of those habits include things like physical activity, you know, life purpose, um, moderate caloric intake, uh, plant-based diets, and so forth. The kinds of things that we all think matter, um, but those seem to be particularly prevalent in these regions. And of course, you know, it's, it's difficult in this case to disentangle whether or not there's uh, genetic linkages to these observations, given that these are regions uh, that are pretty isolated. Um, but nonetheless, it suggests to us that there might be environmental factors that are contributing towards uh, both disease and, and to uh, improvements in health. So I think, you know, one issue uh, that I think most of us uh, are aware of is that in order to really untangle the gene versus environment contributions to resilience, we really need to better uh, measure exposures across the life course. Um, education and income are, are just a proxy for health, uh, lifestyle, and environmental factors. Uh, we need to do a better job of measuring those things more specifically. But there's an usher, another issue, uh, one that's uh, particular to brain science, and that we know that the outcomes are affected by these measures, um, but we don't really have effective measures of aging brain health prior to disease onset, prior to those outcomes. Uh, you know, it's not the case that you can go into your doctor's office and, and get a, an effective measurement of where you are uh, neurologically. Um, that would be a leading indicator of, of, of future illness. Um, so having good measures of aging brain health would really help us better uh, in terms of risk assessment and prognosis, but also in terms of monitoring and evaluating uh, responses to modifiable factors. So those exposures that we think matter, right? If they matter, they should be altering 
um, the, the brain signals that we think uh, are reflective of, of cognitive health. Now, there have been efforts to, of, of course, uh, measure uh, aspects of brain uh, structure and function. Um, and it turns out that when you do this uh, and relate, try to relate those to the types of uh, socioeconomic status measures that uh, predict outcomes, uh, it, they fall short, right? So in this case, I'm highlighting uh, the absence of a relationship between longitudinal changes in brain structure and measures of SES. In this case, for both sides of the slide, uh, I'm showing uh, education. Uh, and you can see that while uh, education is predictive of dementia or dementia risk, it's not relating to longitudinal changes in brain structure, right? So this is cortical volume and hippocampal volume. Uh, and in this, on the right side, we see cortical thickness. There's, there's declines as you would expect with age, but those declines aren't any different between individuals that are college educated, uh, sorry, that lack a college education versus so that have a college education. And this is one distinction in the United States that, that does seem to matter. And I think, so I think one of the problems is that, uh, um, you know, we haven't really focused in on the types of brain measures that are really relevant to cognition and in, in, in terms of, you know, uh, how cognition works. You know, broad domains of cognition happen at the scale of networks. Your brain functions as a large scale network. Uh, and in keeping that with that, we think aging related cognitive decline is due to brain network failure. Um, when you look at, and when you start to look at the types of uh, effects in aging um, that occur over the lifespan, um, they seem very reminiscent of, of, of changes in, in network function in, in other systems where there's vulnerabilities, there's robustness in some cases, uh, but there's also aspects of resilience. And all those things can be quantified uh, in the science of networks. And we've been trying to do that. So just to give you a snapshot of, of how we're doing that and one way in which we're approaching this, um, when you look at large scale networks, right? Network, uh, networks of interacting things, um, which can be technological or social uh, or biological, uh, but one major feature of many organized networks is that they have a modular organization. Uh, and that modular organization really supports the function and distinctiveness of its network parts. So having this, this modular organization allows you to have specialization of, of interacting components. Um, and we can see uh, you know, aspects of this modular organization in, in terms of the internet's construction, uh, but also air transportation networks uh, and even friendship networks. And the brain too exhibits a modular organization, uh, even in the absence of task. So at, at rest, uh, it turns out that the brain is, is uh, exhibits a high degree of activity uh, of changes in brain signal. And if you measure those changes of brain signal uh, across various regions of the brain, different brain regions that are involved in similar cognitive operations are highly correlated, again, in the absence of task. Uh, we call these resting state correlations. And those resting state correlations form into modules. So sets of regions that are permitting aspects of, of function such as vision, which is shown here in the blue, are highly correlated with one another and less correlated with other brain regions that are permitting uh, other aspects of cognitive functions. So in yellow is your control system, one of the control systems. Uh, in green is a, a, called the dorsal attention, uh, uh, dorsal, dorsal attention system involved in visual spatial attention and so forth. So here too, we see this functional specialization where you have sets of communities that are subserving uh, aspects of, of, of information processing and they're segregated from one another. Uh, and we think this is really important for, for allowing the brain to do, to do what it does. Now, this idea of, of segregation, it can go in either direction, right? So having a segregated or modular network, something like this in this toy diagram, uh, but it really requires this fine balance where if you start to prune away uh, connections between areas of the brain, um, you can get a very disconnected network, right? So you could still have specialization of, of those distinct modules, but now they're no longer communicating. And we think that would actually be really bad. But you can go in the other way as well, right? So you could start adding connections between modules or systems that are typically less connected. And that's, that's not a good thing either, because you start to lose this aspect of specialization or the differentiation of the network, right? Things that are uh, that, uh, that should not be talking or communicating or interacting uh, so much with one another um, are starting to do, to do that more and that, that could result in a, in a failure of effective function. So what does it look like in terms of aging? Does, it, you know, does this have any relevance? Well, hopefully you realize it should um, or it does, yeah, otherwise I wouldn't be spending so much time talking about it. Uh, we started to look at this, this property of network organization uh, given its relevance to network function and other domains. Uh, and we started looking at it across the adult lifespan. Uh, this was our initial cross-sectional um, observation where what we found was that with increasing age, you see a decreasing of that segregation, right? So systems of the brain that are typically segregated from one another start 
interacting more as you grow older. Uh, so it looks a little bit like like this this side of the, you know this, this portion of the diagram, where initially in young adults you have a very uh, modular or segregated network organization, uh, and then over time it, it starts de-differentiating. Uh, and, we, and what we observed is that uh, this relates to cognitive function. Uh, so individuals with less segregated networks have poor cognitive function. Uh, and then several other studies, uh, which were all reviewed in this paper here, uh, noted uh, other aspects of, of brain function that are supported by this organization. Um, so the absence of this organization results in altered brain activity. Uh, you could see uh, the impact of training related cognitive gains in relation to this, this measure of, of network organization, uh, but also the outcomes of neuro rehabilitation seem to be related to uh, the initial organization of the, of the brain in, ter in terms of this type of measure. Now, these are all, again, cross-sectional observations, uh, but not everyone's brains age the same, right? So if, if I take uh, two separate individuals and image them over time and measure their network interactions, um, what we can see is that the individual on the left uh, seems to have a pretty similar network over time, right? This is a snapshot of what their brain network looked like at 67, and this is what it looked at, like at 73. Um, I don't have to really even do the math, right, to show, uh, to, to hopefully convince you that this, at least the segregation of their networks are, are comparable, right, that you still see the kind of relative separation of the different systems of the brain, uh, especially when you compare that to the person on the right, right, um, where there's a lot more clumping over time, and you can see this, this massive desegregation. So the big question we had is, do any of these differences, are they explained by our differences in exposures? Um, we had access to a longitudinal data set um, from Washington University's NIGHT ADRC, um, several hundred people with multiple brain scans. Now we don't know everything about these individuals, but we do know their education. Um, so what we did is we simply made that distinction and categorized individuals as a function of whether or not they have a college education. So the question was, does college education differentiate the rates of decline? Now, again, this isn't anything new, but what I'm showing you here is that, you know, we had other, some aspects of information from some of these individuals in other domains. The absence of a college education does result in, in major life outcomes, especially in the United States, um, where we don't have a, a massive social safety net. So individuals without a college education have uh, lower ranking jobs and, and live in, in neighborhoods scoring higher on indices of area deprivation, again, consistent with previous epidemiological work. But do their brain networks change differently um, in terms of this, this property of brain network organization that I've highlighted? And it turns out they do. There's accelerated brain network decline, especially in, in lower, educated, educa uh, lower educated older adults. And you could see them on the left panel here. So on the left is, is below college individuals, on the right are college individuals. And you could see, especially in older ages, there's this acceleration of longitudinal changes in that measure of system segregation. Uh, those, those observations are, are further kind of depicted uh, in these simple slope plots. So you could see the black line is relatively flat, uh, and this would be the college educated adults, whereas the dosh, dashed red line is, 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 is decreasing, uh, especially in older ages. Now, there's, var there's variability, right? It's not the case that having a college degree is meaning you're completely protected and that your networks are not changing, um, but the, the degree of variability uh, is substantially lower when you uh, are uh, absent to college education. Um, now, there's you know, other aspects of their health uh, that we, we know about them. This is, again, uh, this is this analysis of, of data that had been collected before. We didn't have everything we needed, wanted to know. But we were able to confirm that this is irrespective of, of sex and race. Um, it's irrespective of changes in brain structure uh, and in cardiovascular health and mental health and measures of neurological health. Uh, and also in, in terms of measures of Alzheimer's disease related genetic risk or pathology even. Um, the final data point I'll show you is, you know, the, the one that probably, hopefully you're, you're, you're wondering about, right? Does this ultimately matter? And it, it turns out it does. Uh, individuals that are declining in terms of, of this network property um, are more likely um, to, to dement in, in, at a later date. Again, this is data that comes from an Alzheimer's research center. Uh, so we had clinical data on these individuals even after the scan. And what we find is that individuals who show the greatest changes in network organizations, so greatest declines uh, in system segregation, are those that are more likely uh, to come into the clinic with, with a higher degree of dementia severity uh, at a later date. So um, hopefully what I've convinced you of in, in, this, in this quick presentation is that we have identified uh, what I think is a consequential measure of brain network function, uh, which seems to be moderated by environmental exposures. 
Um, again, this this idea of reserve has come up several times, uh, and uh, really, what I think what I think we're getting is a measure that's closer to reserve. Um, you know, reserve is ultimately just unexplained variance in cognition. Uh, but I think these quantitative measures of network function that are related to cognition are, are what we need to capture in order to better understand uh, that, that kind of the missing variable. Um, the, the broader point I want you to take home is that. Complex brain networks develop and age in complex networks of social and economic forces. Uh, and I, I really think that to better understand the resilient brain aging, uh, we need to understand how these networks interact with each other. Um, that this point really kind of came across in the, in the previous presentation by Dr. Costco, uh, but I think it's important to understand what exposures matter and when do they matter. Uh, and how, uh, and then maybe for a discussion point, um, we might want to consider how we can characterize an individual's past exposures and integrate them with their present circumstances. Um, especially when we don't have data sets uh, that are prospective, but rather that we're, we're trying to understand what a, an adult individual's past exposures were. So lots of lots of people contribute to this effort. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to notice the time. I don't know if I'm way over uh, my timing got messed. Mess, uh, my my clock wasn't appearing on my on my presentation here. Um, but lots of people to thank who are involved in this work, uh, and I'm happy to take questions or hopefully uh, engage in a broader discussion about these ideas. Thanks. Okay, great. No, your timing was perfect. perfect. Oh, yeah. I probably spoke way too fast in the end there, but yeah. No, okay. It was great. It was great. We okay. have time for questions. Um, Randy. Can you hear me again? Okay. I can hear you. Hey, Randy. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. It's too bad you couldn't make it, but we'll have you up here at some point. That'd be great. Um, Thousands of questions, which means you have to come back. So I'm, I could ask <laughs> the other nine, 999 questions later on. Um, I guess one of the main points I wanted to, to, to talk, ask, ask your opinion about is this quandary that we face in looking at both developmental research and, and aging, um, but how to deal with cross sectional versus longitudinal data sets. Um, you've probably seen, and you know, all those papers that are they're, they're showing that you actually can get completely different um, predictions sometimes if you look at cross-sectional versus longitudinal, but there's a practical aspect that we just don't have the resources to do massive longitudinal studies, um, and it takes a while to get the data back. So do you have a sort of feel for like, how do we then use, um, we've got lots of cross-sectional data, but how do we use that then to understand these processes that, as you showed, are highly individually specific? Um, and our best understood is longitudinal, but, but we still don't have enough data to really make that connection. So how do we try and you know, bridge those two divides, if you will? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we struggle with this as well, especially given these types of observations. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, part of the part of our concern for this is, is these observations where early life impacts do seem to affect late life brain measures, right? So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, this literature showing that even things like childhood birth weight uh, is, is, is more predictive of, of cortical structure uh, than education or even um, cognitive function, uh, suggesting that there's these, these, these early life impacts or early life exposures that set you up that's, you know, uh, and that ultimately kind of cascade forward. Uh, and that the that what matters is is the intercept more than within the slope. Um, so I, I think you know part of the thing we've been doing is is trying to understand whether or not there are other data types uh, that would allow us to understand trajectories of of exposures, right? Such that uh, we can disentangle uh, two individuals who look similar today, so cross sectional observations. But as a function of all, all their cumulative exposures over time, uh, and then that's that's partly you know what that kind of question point I kind of raised uh, at the end was, because uh, I think that's one way of, of, of at least leveraging uh, the massive efforts that have been put towards collecting these great cross-sectional data sets, right? So we can still understand change in terms of exposures and, and what you've experienced, uh, and then look at snapshot of what your brain health is today uh, via those data sets. I mean, do you have what were your thoughts on it? Hi, Jagan. This is Kalina Kristoff with UBC. Uh, Hi, Kalina. Long time no see. Um, <laughs> great talk. And I also have tons of questions, uh, but I will only ask two if there's there's time. 
Uh, first one is about, so the segregation measure that you have, which is great, and it seems very sensitive to aging and decline. Uh, I'm just wondering, have you tried or have you thought about uh, doing that same measure, but being more selective as to the uh, parts of the brain that you're looking at. So right now you're looking at the entire brain, all the different large scale networks. But what if you take uh, something like the default network, which in and of itself is composed of different sub networks that may interact in less or more flexible way in aging. And I'm asking that because we know that the default network is uh, the primary kind of uh, target for things like dementia, right? It's, it's where dementia starts, it's where the most changes occur. So is it possible that if you take your measure and you apply it to uh, a subset of the brain, you might be able to better detect uh, which parts of the brain might be declining uh, more faster and are more selective for a successful versus unsuccessful aging? It's a great question. Um, do, do you want to do you want me to start there? You said you have two questions. Yeah, but do you want to take I'll that first one? On okay, that's a great question. Yeah, so uh, as you uh, correctly inferred, this is a summary measure of, of whole brain architecture. Um, and it doesn't give us a sense of specific components that might be desegregating more than others. Uh, and you know, I try to make that point uh, in some of the things we've been writing because it's, it's just a measure, right? And the measure, can, the outcome or that, as a, that measure itself can be a consequence of very different configurations and people have to be aware of that, right? Um, this idea that there might be specific components that are more affected uh, in one process such as aging versus another, such as dementia, I believe that's entirely true. You know, we have something that uh, is, is currently under review that, that highlights this. So, in, and you could, see, you could see that dementia, if you look at individuals with increasing dementia severity, they also exhibit uh, these patterns and you can quantify the same pattern of system segregation and they decline in this case with, with increasing dementia severity. You can untangle the age effect versus the dementia effect in terms of the measure. But when you look at the topological changes or differences, they're, they're being mediated by dif different reconfigurations. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna walk you through the whole slide because there's lots of little details here, but the, my point here is that uh, there are specific changes that, that accompany dementia that are different than those that accompany aging. Uh, and, you, and we're able to measure, you know, in, in this case, the desegregation of specific components, such as the default network, uh, as you highlighted, which, which seems to obviously play a role in, in dementia. You could probably see that here. Yeah, that's a great question though. That's great to see. Um, okay, my second question has to do with this notion about, uh, from your TICS 2017 paper, the segregation of brain systems is defined by a balance of within and between system relationships. I want to ask the question and just <clears throat> invite you to uh, share with us a little further uh, your thoughts around that, because I'm curious about how dynamics play into that. So balance can be uh, more of a static thing, or is there some kind of a dynamic balance? So the balance of how they, these relationships change over time that actually creates a balance that's more resilient than if you just try to achieve some kind of a single state balance. That's another uh, great question. Uh, so yeah, uh, again, as, as you're acutely aware, we've, we've really focused on the um, architecture of resting state correlations as defined by the, the correlation of the whole time series. We, we spent a little bit, we've started to spend a little bit, a little bit of time looking at non-stationarity of these signals uh, and how that balance might shift. Um, but we haven't, we haven't done enough to, to really kind of uh, understand them deeply. Uh, I think it, it's a fascinating area in terms of thinking about these processes as, as you know, uh, as evolving uh, at multiple time scales, right? So obviously the time scale I've been talking about is years, but they certainly evolve over seconds as well. Uh, and, and whether or not those different scales of time uh, can be linked uh, and informative of one another, I think is, is, a, is a deep question that needs to be further explored. Uh, and we, we, we're just starting to do that now. Randy, again, I just want to make a comment um, based on uh, Kalina's question about dynamics. There's, there are some papers, you probably know Gagan as well, but um, if you look at switching a functional connectivity in age, you do see a reduction in the, in the, in the amount of switching that actually happens. Um, and that is actually consistent with the loss of segregation because you have fewer network configurations you can actually visit, which means you have fewer places to switch. So it's a nice a, a connection between the, we can think of a sort of a static measure of, in some respects, of segregation integration, but also if you look at the dynamics, it maps quite nicely onto that as well. 
Yeah, I think that's that's another great illustration, right? So I guess when I talked about dynamics, I was thinking about them over over the course of a resting state scan. But you're totally right. Like at the end of the day, this is all about what we're doing during task, right? What we're doing, we're trying to do something. And I, in, in 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 my mind, what's happening here is is the resting state is your architecture, your baseline architecture from which we enable task processing. And this idea of desegregation, what it's indicating is that uh, the network has to, you know traverses a, a larger space in order to get to an ideal task network right when when an individual is older because you have to undo this like you know or it's like unsticking um the systems that are, are too sticky in order to effectively deal with what they're what the individual is trying to do and that that would kind of be consistent with your uh with your observation regarding uh uh switch costs yeah right hi there this is sarah from simon fraser thank you so much for the talk um, I'm, I really am curious about the education component, and I'm wondering if there is a similar type of maybe network mapping going on about the social determinants that accompany education. So I'm thinking, like, is it the social aspects of having a college education, or is it the structure it provides, or the improved SES possibilities versus, you know, your ability to take on and then pay off massive amounts of student debt? Do you have any thoughts on what it is about education um, that's that's coming up here? So that's those are those are great questions, and that's exactly what we're what we want to know, right? So again, this is uh, we, we're uh, we're bound by the data set in, in the in case of the data I presented to you, where we didn't have all this information. You know, we we had their zip codes for a few individuals, we had their occupations, but we you know the social determinants of health uh, are uh, are they're much much more beyond um, those few variables, right? And and even beyond social determinants, you could think about environmental exposures like toxins. Um, so. While we don't have that for you know this this these these analyses of archival data sets, uh, we're currently uh, engaged in a study uh, focused on midlife um, and trying to understand environmental exposures uh, over the life's course. Um, so I can give you a sense of what we're doing, um, and and this is I think at the heart of, of what you're asking, right? So. Uh, what are the exact exposures that matter? We we don't think it's that diploma, as I said. We think there's a lot more to it, and uh, again, that, that's not, I'm not saying anything that um, everyone here probably doesn't believe. Um, but how do we measure those things? So we've uh, you know we're recruiting um, individuals that we think are at higher risk of of, of dementia and other age related illnesses uh, based on income levels. Um, this is focused on midlife, you know, prior to uh, disease onset uh, for most individuals. And we're, you know, we're doing longitudinal assessment of, of all these brain changes, but also trying to understand sensory motor function, which I think is critical to understand, uh, especially in terms of the links between sensory motor function and dementia. Uh, but then for health and lifestyle and exposures and socialization, uh, we've got, um, you know, a, a collection of, of techniques that we're using, which include daily digital diaries, but also passive sensors uh, and then biospecimens. Uh, and then also just instruments to understand uh, life course exposures, right? Um, we're borrowing from uh, the HRS, uh, which is based in Michigan, uh, to understand where an individual grew up uh, over time and, um, you know, what schools they went to and uh, the types of exposures they had, just to try to cobble together a sense of what an individual has experienced. Uh, and, then, and then again, we keep measuring this longitudinally every two years to see whether or not some of those more proximal exposures are changing. Uh, in order to link them to changes in the, in the brain. Does that does that get at your question? I guess I answered your question by saying what we want to do, not really giving you an answer. Yes, thank you very much. That's wonderfully helpful. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the uh, talk. This is Marion from SFU. I'm wondering Hi. with like what you've said, it kind of seems like there's changes in like the small world like phenomenon seen in these networks. So like it's specifically related to modularity and like the path link between the different communities. And I'm curious if you think too, if it's not just like the changes that you're seeing um, relate to like the flexibility of the networks, but also the efficiency of them and how that relates to the disease state. Yeah, so when you say efficiency, do you mean like uh, in, in terms of network, like, like, um, like a global efficiency, like the actual graph theoretic measure of it? Or do you mean uh, in terms of uh, actually how an individual would deploy these networks for purposes of task engagement? More so like in the global perspective. Uh, so maybe at the, metri at, the metric, at the metric perspective, like uh, the actual measurement of efficiency of a network? Um, 
yeah just like in general like how you know efficient like i guess communication is between those different networks if you look at yeah i see so one caveat to, to to this is that you know these are correlations of i i guess i didn't really uh go into this i, should, I probably should have spent a little bit more time these are correlations of resting state signals um so we don't you know they're first of all they're not physical connections um so we you know usually their physical connections are correlated at rest um, but many of these could be multi-synaptic, um, but they're also not necessarily communication path signals, right? So it's not, and these aren't action potentials, right? Across sets of neurons that are within brain areas. Uh, these are just the correlations of the time series. So we think they reflect functional relatedness and we know that they do, uh, but I, I can't really speak to uh, aspects of communication efficiency um, directly based on this data. Uh, but I think you know Randy's observation regarding how how these uh, the the age impacts on task configuration, right? That those observations are relevant to thinking about uh, efficiency of of information processing or thinking about effective information processing. Uh, so I think there's there's a link there. Uh, and then there's another way of thinking about efficiency, and that's uh, this idea of there's actual measures of of, of network efficiency, right? Of, of how easy you can get from one side of a network to another. Right, so it's played at its length. Uh, and there too, you know, some of these measures of modularity and segregation, they're related to those measures of efficiency. But in terms of resting state correlations, they're hard to interpret because we're not dealing with physical paths. Uh, so measures of efficiency are also related to what I've shown you in terms of age, but I think the interpretation is much more nuanced in that case. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I know, Randy, you wanted to say a few words at the end, but if we, we still have some time, if anybody wants to have the mic, great. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, Jasmine Chatwall from uh, MGH. Hi, Jasmine. Hey, Jasmine. So, um, you know, these, uh, this desegregation that you're talking about, um, what do you think the underlying neurobiology of it is? Is it loss of synapses? Is it change in reticular activating system function? Is it loss of brain? Um, what do you think is underlying this phenomenon? Yeah, that's, that's another great question. Uh, so, I, so it's, it's certainly not due to global atrophy. You know, we can we can we we can test that directly, right? So it isn't just due to changes in cortical thickness. Um, it also doesn't seem to be linked to in in case of of, of uh, dementia or even uh, preclinical dementia. It doesn't relate strongly to the presence of amyloid, and uh, we're we're looking at tau now. Um, it, it, but it, you know, all, it seems like it's not as obviously linked. Um, so, well, that's a little bit disheartening. I, I think it, it actually there's there's uh, there's again more nuance to it in that uh, what what it seems what I think what I think happens is you see, you have these vulnerable locations. Um, that when and when those vulnerable locations degrade, uh, you start to see these these alterations in, in configuration of large scale networks. Uh, so in that case, it, it could be due to uh, neurodegeneration at specific locations, gray matter thinning, or even uh, deterioration of white matter pathways. But I don't think it's as simple as as, as you know, just the, the the whole network is is vulnerable to like just global changes. I think there are really uh, might be vulnerable spots of the brain um, that, that that seem to uh, impact these these correlation structures. Um, I think your comment about uh, reticular activation, activating system as well is interesting because I think uh, these kind of large scale neuromodulatory systems probably do play a role in, in setting up functional distinctiveness. Uh, and we haven't had a, a good way of, of measuring the correspondence between those signals yet. Anybody Since else? no one's clamoring for the mic, um, can I ask a follow then do you see regional differences in just signal to noise then? Because if you're losing if you're losing uh, cortical thickness even in vulnerable areas, you should be able to do a nodal measure and either look at signal to noise or look at atrophy within uh, you know the centroid of your node or something like that. Yeah, great question. Um, so we we measure uh, we've we've looked at signal to noise uh, signal to noise in specific nodes. Uh, we've we've looked at we've looked at measures of atrophy as I as I kind of alluding to. There is an interesting story with atrophy, uh, and it relates to the, the topology of the network to begin with. So it's atrophy in certain locations seem to uh, result in, in downstream impacts in terms of changes of networks and we're, we're kind of uh, working on that that's uh, that's uh, that observation now i'll show you one other data point relevant to other kind of properties um the nice thing about doing a zoom thing is i could just jump usually just jump to this, these things 
Um, you know, because one one of the concerns is that uh, there's there's differences in in um, cerebrovascular reactivity across these regions. Which I mean, in aging, we know there are. Um, and for at least the cross-sectional work, uh, what we're able to do is uh, evaluate whether or not some of these brain network changes uh, are due to variability in cardiovascular health as, as a summary measure, uh, but then maybe more relevant to what you asked, uh, whether or not there's regional variability in, in, in CVR, cerebrovascular reactivity using CVR maps. Uh, and when we control for that, you know, the, the kind of regional variability uh, at the nodal level, um, we, we still see these effects. So I think, you know, some of, some of the vascular demands and differences in vascular demands across the network are, are probably contributing to some of the effects, but not in entirety, uh, because there's, there's still a lot of variation uh, in, uh, with respect to age, uh, even when you account for, for some of those factors, uh, in addition to uh, um, kind of global measures of atrophy and, and, and as I mentioned, amyloid. Hi. Um, I'm Abdul from Simon Fraser University. Um, Hi, Abdul. In the starting of your presentation, you say that uh, there are some individuals that are, are resistant to the genetics. And I was wondering if um, like you look into trying to subtype the individuals based on the genetic resistance and uh, do the same analysis that you did try to see uh, like how um, the brain networks age within each subgroups. And um, so maybe this can uh, lead to a better understanding in uh, the individual differences because, so we know that like the genetics are risk factors that are not non-modifiable compared to like some of the life exposures that can be modifiable. And so maybe this can, um, uh, this can be uh, a direction to look in, or maybe you, you have already, already done that. That's a, I mean, that's a great set of questions. Uh, so I'll say a few things. Um, first, I'm, I'm gonna try not to steal the thunder because I imagine just Mir is gonna talk about, a lot about uh, some of these genetic observations. Uh, some of that work that I, that I mentioned was, was, was done over at MGH where just Mir is a, um, uh, where just Mir holds his position. Um, so, but in terms of thinking about the role of genetics, uh, you know, um, uh, we have some data points relevant to it. Uh, so uh, the declines uh, that are prognostic of dementia that I showed you, um, that we see those irrespective of APOE status, which is, uh, is a genetic risk factor for late onset AD. Um, so that, that's one thing that's interesting. We haven't gone in, we don't, we don't have, uh, we haven't, we don't have sample sizes yet to be able to go in. Uh, so that's, that's this observation I wish when you here. Um, we don't have sample sizes to be able to do subtypes based on genetic risk yet, uh, but that's, that's certainly something we're thinking about. Um, you know, and the other, the other place that genetics comes in and thinking about uh, SES is whether or not, again, uh, these er early childhood exposures or, or socioeconomic statuses are, are what matters. Um, and uh, one way we've kind of been able to indirectly get at that is, you know, we, what we can do is control for uh, parental education, which again, there's, there's, a, there's a genetic component to educational status, uh, but even when we control for parental education, um, adult SES still seems to be explaining significant variance with respect to network outcomes or network observations. So I think uh, I, th I think there's there's a, certainly a, an interaction right between uh, uh, genetics, early exposures, and, and late exposures. Um, but you know, I guess I'll use this moment just to say that I I, I certainly believe that it's not all childhood. I think um, you know the things you do uh, during adulthood are certainly going to matter in terms of aging, and, and, and it's important for us to to consider that uh, both in terms of the negative but also the positive. There, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll find ways of, of protecting uh, towards accelerated decline uh, as, we, as we kind of keep on with this work. Thank you very much. We are out of time. Thank you so much, Gagan. That was so great to hear about your amazing work. Thank you for the discussion today. Um...